and greet you. There he is. Wave to him. Do the Barbie. Thank you. Um, tonight's really exciting because we have an opportunity to get to know the candidates more closely who will be representing us on our school board. So we appreciate the fact that you've come. Um, we're going to turn it over here real quickly to our good friend, Mr. Kyle Palmer from KCUR, who's going to be our moderator. But um, he is going to give you some uh, minor instructions, but we are going to have questions asked first that are pre-asked, but you guys were all given note cards, so feel free either to go and start those or if you hear an answer that you'd like a question more, make sure that you write that. And people will be kind of, if you kind of go like this, somebody will see your hand. So we're going to get started with Mr. Collins. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kyle Palmer. My day job, or my morning job, really, is to I do the morning news for KCUR 89.3, Kansas City Public Radio, Monday through Friday. And very pleased to be here. Um, and apropos to tonight, I am a former teacher as well. I spent nine years in the classroom. My last stop was in my hometown of Independence, Missouri. I'm going to use an old teacher trick and say that last night we had a great crowd and they asked some really good questions. <laughs> so if that motivates you. <laughs> but uh, thank you to our candidates as well um, for being here tonight. Uh, it should be a, a fun evening, um, as I said last night. Um, great questions, um, interesting discussion, um, and we expect the same tonight. As me said, let, let me lay out very quickly the format for tonight. This is going to go in four parts. Um, first. Each candidate is going to uh, make an opening statement. They're going to get three minutes to do that. Uh, second will be the first phase of questioning. As Denise indicated, these are pre-written questions written by the organizers of this debate. That will last you know, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, depending on time. While that is happening, you should have or will soon receive index cards. Um, and while the first half of the debate is going on, if a question strikes you or you already have a topic in your mind that you know you want to ask about, go ahead and write a question down. Members of the Shawnee Mission Area Council will be collecting those throughout the first half of the debate. So then in the third part of the debate, the second question portion will be questions asked by you. I will collect those, and for transparency's sake, I'll say that uh, I'll try to group questions around common themes that I'm noticing. If there are multiple questions asked about the same topic, and I'll try to ask a question that's representative, representative of, of all of those questions and try to get through as many of your questions as possible. The fourth part of the debate will be closing statements um, each candidate will get two minutes to make a closing statement and we'll be out of here uh, by 8.30. So welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, let's begin. The first part will be opening statements. Candidates, are you ready? Sure. Great. So we'll start uh, from uh, the, the far left. As you're looking at it, Craig Denny, and go down the line, you'll get three minutes each to make an opening statement. Cool. Well, as Kyle said, I am Craig Denny, and I've been on the board for a while. I, by day, I'm a consulting engineer. I worked for, worked for Terracon in almost 44 years. In 1985, I was moved here from Iowa. And our kids' daughters were seven, three, and one. So they all think they're Kansans. We bought a house, uh, and we never moved, but we started at Apache, and then we went to uh, uh, Hollup, and then to Rising Star, and then to West Ridge, and then to West. And for, all those years, plus a few more after they all graduated, we've been members of the various PTAs. Um, we posted uh, four exchange students during that period of time, so I've had plenty of kids in school. They have now reached the age where I have grandchildren in the school. So I've still got skin in the game. My daughter Ella, or my granddaughter Ella, is uh, probably the smartest child in Shawnee Mission. <laughs> Without, without it. Um, as I say, I've been on the board now 20 years. Uh, I've uh, run for election and re-election. The first time because I was encouraged to do so by Joan Bowman, who was mayor of Lenexa and a former member of this board. Um, I used to drive the van truck for Shawnee Mission West band. And Joan said one day, why don't you do this? You're up there all the time anyway. And so I did. It's been very rewarding. I think the best part of this job is uh, handing the kids their diploma. Um, and then there are other parts of the job that aren't so much fun. But that's my story. And just to be clear before we move on, if you have three minutes, 
Denise is keeping time in case you get close to that. You'll see the, the bright green placard that comes up one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, five seconds, four seconds. It's not that many, but right. sorry to interrupt. My name is Laura Guy, and I've lived in the West Attendance area for 22 years. Both of my children uh, grew up going to the schools in the West area, Pawnee Elementary, West Ridge Middle School, and then they both graduated from Shawnee Mission West High School. Uh, I got my bachelor's in elementary education from UMKC, and I taught for several years in the Olathe School District, taught third grade, and then I was a substitute teacher for several more years after that. In 2001, I went back to school myself and received my uh, Master's of Divinity degree from St. Paul School of Theology. I'm now an ordained pastor in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ denomination. And I started a church, which is in the Parkville area, called Living Water Christian Church. I'm still the pastor there. My husband, Cliff, also works for a church. He's the IT director at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. So it's kind of a family business with us. One thing I think you should know about me is that um, I'm not a sports fan. And it's important for you to know that about me because for seven years, I sat in the bleachers of virtually every Shawnee Mission West home football game, even though I'm not a sports fan, and honestly, I don't even understand the rules of football. But I was there every home game to cheer on our kids who were in the marching band. And I realized that even though I didn't understand what was happening on the field, I was still cheering for the players on the field, and I was cheering for the cheerleaders, and I was cheering for the flag team, and I was cheering for the mascot. And I realized that even though I had come with the purpose of just cheering for my kids, that in that moment, we were all parents of all of the kids. And so the parents who uh, weren't music lovers were cheering for the band kids, too. And I think that that's a perfect metaphor for our community and how we do come together and we do support one another's kids and cheer one another's kids on. One of my favorite quotes is, there's no such thing as other people's children. And I, I believe that. I think that's true. I think the children in our community belong to all of us. And their education should be a priority for all of us. And we all need to do what we can to ensure that they all get a high quality education, no matter what their specific needs may be. So I want to make sure that the next superintendent is the right one for our district. Someone who will work with parents and teachers, administrators, and the public to build and strengthen and make us even better. And I want to make sure our schools are safe so students can focus on learning. I want to make sure that no students are overlooked or given less than they need to be successful. And I want to make sure that the parents and the school board work together, trusting one another to make the best decisions for the students. And that's why I'm running for the school board. Good evening, my name is Christopher White. I've lived in the district for 30 years. Uh, I have uh, a degree in architecture, I'm a registered architect. I have a master's in engineering in building systems, mechanical and plumbing. I was an educational facilities designer for 40, almost 40 years, and I worked for the school district for 10 years as the bond and capital improvement supervisor. I was very, very fortunate to work with this board, and probably a couple of dozen other boards around the Midwest, as that meant I worked with the communities, the administration, the teachers, the parents, to determine what was needed, by the, what was needed uh, to build in the district, what curriculums were important for the district, what the financial circumstances were for a district, and help them pass bond issues and then construct the projects that they really needed for, to educate their children and to provide a learning space for teachers to teach in. Uh, I recently was uh, happily uh, endorsed by the uh, uh, Shawnee Mission EDA. Uh, I have a few concerns that uh, I would like to help the district address. I won't be making the decisions. I will be helping guide the, the decision-making process, which, of course, first of all, First off, it should be transparent. It's a word that everybody's using these days, and a concern, which is appropriate, appropriate concern. Uh, we would love, as patrons and part of the community and the teachers, to understand the process that, uh, for the decisions that have been made, or that we will be making in the future. It's, you know, what's been decided in the past has obviously been decided, 
but we as a community together have an opportunity to see what we can do to help make good decisions for the district. Uh, I would love to ha have you guys uh, vote uh, this uh, August 1st for me, but uh, I just please vote and I would enjoy your endorsement as well. Thank you. Thank you for those introductions. If we uh, can now move to the first question phase of this forum. Again, these are questions that have been predetermined, selected and written by the organizers of this forum, and they'll be selected through a very uh, scientific method. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll take this for, we'll, th we'll see about long, uh, you know, thir 30 to 45 minutes and see how long it goes. I will remind you that if you have not written a question down, if you have a question, go ahead and write it down, or at any point during the first half of this debate to write it down, and we will collect those, and those will be the questions for the second half of our debate. Uh, these questions have um, been given to me, they've been given to the candidates, so they've kind of seen these, they've looked at them, but it's kind of like a final in college where they've seen them, but they don't know if they're going to be asked, so they have to be prepared for all of them. I will select them, we'll start with Mr. Denny, move down, and then the second question, we'll start with this guy, and go down and so on and so forth. So the first question, and we'll start with Mr. Denny. What role do you believe the board can play in ensuring that the district can attract and retain high quality, experienced teachers? One and a half minutes. Well, the board has, I think, done a pretty good job of structuring the administration with an HR department that is focused on recruiting. We're doing a better job recruiting in the Midwest than we maybe did a few years ago. We also have the um, changed plan or policy to recruit and hire for a pool earlier in the year. So we are issuing contracts to new teachers uh, November, December, before the school year starts the next August. We used to, under Dr. Johnson and Dr. Kaplan, wait until we were certain we had openings and then we'd hire for that opening. The problem with that is that you are uh, now recruiting from a pool of teachers that don't have jobs and some of the best and brightest have already been taken. So I think that's, that moves us forward. I think we have a very competitive salary schedule. Uh, the data I've looked at uh, indicate that uh, we are the highest in the metropolitan <coughs> What role do you believe the board can play in ensuring the district can attract and retain high quality experienced teachers? In talking to several teachers, um, I was alarmed to hear them tell stories of um, student teachers that would be teaching in the district and the teachers here in this district were encouraging the student teacher to not apply here but to apply in other districts. Um, and I think that's because the teacher morale is so low. So I think the first thing the board needs to do is to address this problem of teacher morale so that we can retain the high quality teachers that we have. They have not felt like their input has been valued. They haven't felt like their experience and their wisdom has been valued. And so I think reaching out to them and say, we want your help in finding the next superintendent. We want your help in uh, making de these important decisions that are coming before the board. We value the experience that you have. We value the on the ground wisdom that you have. And we, we want you to know that we hear you. And I think when we do that, then the teachers are going to have a much higher rate of job satisfaction, which teachers talk to each other. And I think they'll let all of their other teacher friends know this is a great place to work and uh, people do care about us and the experiences that we have and we are treated like professionals. <coughs> Excuse me, the culture of the, in our district is set by the board. The board needs to promote a culture of respect, understanding, and uh, appreciation for the core of our district, which is the teachers. Uh, I totally agree with what Laura said on her comments about it is important to understand and respect the education, the experience, and the successes of our teachers. And at, for the past several years, I think everybody in the, uh, from what I've heard, doesn't feel that is the case. So as we go down the road, we as a board, if we're elected, will need to reestablish a culture of respect for our teachers. 
Uh, compensation is another one, and of course compensation is good, but compensation is not just a paycheck. It's how they are supported for education, uh, for uh, uh, as well as uh, this uh, projects that they want to promote, or uh, places that they might want to go, or uh, just the general economics of uh, classroom support. So. The next question will begin with Ms. Guy. What are your thoughts on how the board can support the district's special education? Well, funding, of course, is the first way you support it. And unfortunately, um, to some extent, our hands are tied based on what the state is prepared to give us to help with special education funding. But I think the board needs to be a strong advocate um, to get that funding that we need, that our students so desperately need. And then I think they can encourage community participation in uh, supporting our special education classes. I think highlighting some of the amazing things that special ed teachers and paras are doing with the students, uh, giving those stories some more attention, some more visibility in the community, I think um, highlights some of the great work that's being done in those places. I think also, again, going back to teachers, <coughs> talking to those special ed teachers, talking to the paras, and asking them, what more can we do for you? How can we help in what you're trying to do with the special ed kids? How can you um, be more effective in what you're trying to do with these kids? Opening those lines of communication, listening to the feedback we're getting, and then make changes as necessary. There's possibly uh, one point, we heard last night, approximately a $1.2 million cut in federal funding uh, that is coming possible. One of the things which the board could do and the district could do is start planning now how to absorb those cuts and figure out ways ahead of time and plan ahead uh, uh, for our funding restrictions that the state and federal funds, uh, are, the, the lack of state and lack of federal funds is going to impose upon our district and our students and the teachers and the parents. There are many uh, uh, programs uh, that are have been cut over the past uh, several years due to state funding cuts or the economy of the district uh, from 10 years ago, uh, approximately 10 years ago. I think as we go down the road and we decide how we're going to allocate money, the advocacy of the board for those programs is very, very important. What we do with respect to special education is essentially promulgated by ISEA and other statutes. So we fully support special ed and we transfer funds from the general fund into special ed because we don't have funding coming from the Fed. Years ago, they, when they passed ISEA in 72, they said they'd fund up to 40%. I don't think they've ever gotten more than 18% uh, coming through. We get a lot of unfunded mandates. When it comes to budgeting, um, the board approves the budget, but believe me when I tell you that we've been working on this year's budget since last September. Um, we'll be working on what we think will be next year's budget, probably starting right now. And there are a lot of uncertainties, the least of which is what that may do with Medicaid, but we don't even know today whether the Supreme Court is going to approve what the legislature did. And so we're still sort of stymied as far as completing our teacher negotiations and finishing our staff. Thank you. The next question will be given to Mr. White. Please describe the role or influence, if any, you believe local businesses should have in district curriculum and programming. One of the greatest partners for the district is the business community. We, uh, they have supported the Shawnee Mission School District for almost 60 years, uh, not only with their taxes, but with their uh, support of the mentoring programs, support of internships. Uh, these are great programs that have helped a lot of kids uh, tra uh, transition into uh, their, the real world. Uh, I think uh, as far as uh, providing funds for the district. I think the business community has provided many dollars to our foundation so that we can support uh, occupational programs. Uh, 
uh, like the ones here at the Academic Center. I uh, would like to see uh, uh, more mentors in the high school programs. Uh, it would be uh, extremely helpful to uh, establish a, a, a more formal program for the mentorship program, if we could. We do depend on our business partners. Uh, we continue to grow partnerships. Um, firms such as Cerner and Stowers are engaged in our biotech program with Brenda Potts. One of the more interesting engagements that almost came by accident occurred in a conversation that Dr. Henson and Dr. Southwick and I were having with Mayor Bain and Eric Wade in one accident. And Eric Wade remarked that they had trouble hiring policemen, finding policemen, finding EMTs, finding firefighters. That has grown into Project Blue Eagle, which has been shepherded by Chief Douglas, who's head of our safety and security department. We thought we would be lucky this last fall if we had 100 students enrolled. We surpassed that by several hundreds, and I'm not sure we're not up to 800 now in a program that will provide for certifications for students who graduate to become firefighters and EMTs immediately and be qualified to go to the uh, police department. I think our district relies on the partnerships that we have with many local businesses. I think they help in all kinds of ways, not just financial ways. I think a lot of them encourage employees to volunteer in the schools and uh, maybe partner with schools. I know for PTA carnivals, there's lots of donations from local businesses as another way that they support the schools. I'm all in favor of that. I, I think the only thing we need to be aware of is at what point does it cross the line and begin marketing to our kids? And as long as we're very careful about where that line is and we keep our eye on that line and make sure that we're not exposing our kids to marketing messages that we don't in, intend for them, that the parents don't intend for them to have, uh, I think we should just continue to encourage whatever involvement we can get with local businesses. Thank you. The next question will begin with Mr. Denny. The district's digital learning initiative has been in place for several years now. What are your thoughts on the implementation and effectiveness of this initiative, and how can the board support the district in this effort? Well, when it was brought to us several years ago, we thought this was the appropriate thing to do for our students. A one-to-one -one initiative brought with it some challenges. Uh, we learned some things along the way. In hindsight, we could have rolled it out in a little different way, perhaps. I'm proud of the way that we did get the, uh, the devices into the schools and into the students' hands. We had some issues with bandwidth. Not everything worked uh, like we hoped it would. Um, so I think we can do better, but I think we can go back. We are where we are, and we have to keep pushing forward because I think it is the future for our students. Technology is always a double-edged sword, and I'm proud that our district is providing technology for kids who might not have access to it in their homes because of a lack of funds. I think when our graduates go out into the world, they're going to have to be technologically savvy to, to be able to compete in colleges and in careers. And so I'm proud that we're providing that opportunity. I do have concerns about technology because there's always the downside to it too. I think security issues are something that we all have to be aware of. I think the district especially has to be aware of security issues and privacy issues as well as our kids are using this technology. I've heard from some parents who do have concerns that they can't opt out, that uh, they would be responsible to replace one of these iPads if they broke. Um, and I have parents who are concerned about screen time. They don't want their kids sitting in front of a screen to learn. They want their child to interact with other people because social development is so important. It's one of the important things that children learn in schools. So I think those are all valid concerns. And I think as we move forward, we have to keep those in mind, as well as what are the replacement costs going to be when these devices fail or when the technology is outdated. Um, that's going to take up, I think, a bigger and bigger part of our budget. So uh, those are good questions for us to keep in mind as we move forward with technology. As Dr. Denny said, uh, with any project this big and any pro uh, 
roll out this complicated, there's going to be hiccups, and there were. Some of the things that I had concerns about were teacher training and integrating, figuring out ways to integrate it into our curriculum uh, and standard curriculum, and it not be the center of our teaching. It's a tool, it's a great tool, and we should embrace technology very much because it is our future. Uh, screen time, as Laura said, is we have a problem with kids being on their phones too much. We had a young man in our home for a while, and he was always on his phone. He never got off his phone. You walk down the street and kids are always looking at their phone instead of maybe interacting with each other. I uh, was uh, very happy to uh, have an opportunity to go to the innovation school a while back and watch some kids in a third grade class. They were using the tool, the, their iPads as a toy. So I think there's some problems here with monitoring how the, uh, the units are used especially in the lower level elementary grades. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The next question will begin with Ms. Guy. Please discuss the ways in which you personally would work to engage stakeholders with the board, such as parents, patrons, students, teachers, staff, local businesses, and community groups. I was able to attend one of the forums when they were discussing boundary issues and it was a, it was a come and go open house kind of thing. And uh, I thought that was a great model for how members of the community could come in, could have a face-to-face -face conversation with the board member, could ask their questions and get an immediate response or at least someone who would say, I'll look into that and get back with you. I think that's a model we can replicate in, in all kinds of ways. We can specifically invite certain populations. We can invite uh, the parents of special ed kids in and have those face-to-face -face conversations. We can invite a business community in and have those face-to-face -face conversations. I think another great idea would be if, I know board members attend school functions all the time, but I think if we were intentional about it and let the parents who are coming to that school event know there's going to be a board member there and if you have questions or concerns, come 30 minutes early or stay 30 minutes after and have an opportunity to talk face to face with the board member so that we can uh, hear your concerns. I think those kinds of small group or one to one interactions are the ways to get uh, more engagement, more involvement from all the different populations who have a stake in the school district. <coughs> at one time, <coughs> excuse me, at one time the district had advisory councils for the different buildings. These were a great way for there to be interaction on critical issues, to have a discussion about what the concerns and problems might be by implementing some uh, district policies. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have open discussion about <coughs> issues that are crucial to the community. And so I think in public meetings, uh, as Laura said, before and after different school functions, there might be an opportunity to have conversations about uh, concerns that are, are percolating through the district, as we have had over the last several years. I would tell you, I would probably do what I've always done, and that's make myself readily available. I have an email uh, address at the district, and I have a phone address, and everybody can look me up in the phone book, and you know my cell phone. And I'm happy to talk to anybody anytime. Chamber events or other events or visiting West, uh, just wandering around. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk anytime. Thank you. Five questions in. Just want to remind you if you have written your questions down, go ahead and do that. If you have a burning question, uh, members of the Shrine Missionary Council will soon begin to collect those and we can uh, use those in the second question portion. The next question will start with Mr. White. Sorry if I cough, there's something caught in my throat. I don't know <laughs> All right, the question. Please describe your thoughts on individual schools' fundraising efforts. Should individual schools be allowed to raise funds for programs, services, and facilities not all schools can afford? Why or why not? <clears throat> While working with the district, I had the opportunity to work on Highlands Elementary School. The parents there had a great foundation and raised a lot of money to provide a wood floor in the gymnasium and provide a science room, a dedicated <coughs> science room. This was a, a, a wonderful thing. I was thrilled to be involved with it and was able to uh, institute uh, 
a dedicated science room at Apache and a couple other schools as we as the, in the following buildings that were built. Uh, I was involved in several discussions about was it fair that they could raise the money. I think there's other uh, avenues for the buildings that could not raise money uh, like this, at, whether it's through the foundation asking for grants to help them. But I think there's other funding sources for the buildings that may not have the resources at some of the other buildings. So this is where you can easily talk out of both sides of your mouth. We have argued as a district for years that our district should be allowed to raise money for district programs for the local option budget. And the folks in other parts of the state disagree. And so it sort of sounds like that's kind of a false argument when you turn around and say should some schools in our own district who have more resources be allowed to raise funds. We have a policy that essentially says you can't raise funds to fund a certified position. But we allow other positions, other funding, other things. Um, I wish we could spread that around but our schools have the ability to create their own foundations and, and they are able to spend that money. I can't count the number of chili suppers and spaghetti suppers I've participated in as a parent, all to raise money for special activities and special things that the schools were doing. And I was happy to do it. And um, it, builds fellowship and camaraderie among the different parents while you're working on these things together. And we're able to provide things for the schools that their budgets just won't allow. So I think absolutely parents should still have the opportunity to do that. I do think, however, that there is a place for education to um, talk to some of these PTA groups and some of these schools that do have more money and say, how can we partner with some of these schools who just can't get an active PTA group going? Or when they can, they can't do these huge fundraisers. Is there some way that you could partner with them and do an event together? Even if their parents couldn't do 50% of the work, maybe you could agree ahead of time that you'd still give them 50% of the proceeds. And I think there might be a way that um, all the PTA parents I knew are good people who care about, again, all the kids in the district. They're all our kids. And I think if you sat down and explained that to them and gave them some options about how they might be able to do a fundraiser like that in, in the school year, I think you would at least find some of them open to that possibility, and that might be a way to help those schools who don't have an active PTA. The next question will begin with Mr. White. Do you? The next question will begin with Mr. Denning. Do you support the idea of emergency teaching credentials? Why or why not? Well, I do, and I think that's probably a statewide issue because of some of the difficulty in finding teachers for small districts out of state. But I also think that we have some opportunities, and Project Lead the Way in Engineering comes to mind because that's my background. I think we could create some opportunities for some teachers in some fields where they have expertise that would benefit our students. Well, I think the word emergency is right there in the question. If it, emergency credentials means that something's not right, that you aren't finding qualified, certified teachers that you need to, to cover all the classes. And I think that's a, a deeper question that the school board should look at, the school district should look at. Why are we unable to get qualified, certified teachers to teach these classes? And if there's a problem, then that problem needs to be addressed. I think emergency certifications can be used as a short-term kind of stopgap measure, but I think <coughs> the deeper issues need to be addressed um, in why we're not finding the teachers that we need that are qualified to, to teach those classes. As we uh, go down the road in the future, 
we will have times when we don't have enough teachers. The teaching population is changing. Uh, we aren't getting as many uh, students going into education, as, uh, into the education field as we have in the past because they are not compensated appropriately maybe, because they are not necessarily respected as much. I uh, would love to see uh, the district partner with businessmen, uh, myself as an architect, or other professionals to come in temporarily to help the district uh, uh, fill some gaps that they might have. But as uh, has been said, it is a should be a temporary solution to it. The next question will begin with Ms. Guy. How would you go about making decisions about a service or program if outside pressure is brought to bear on the board? I looked at this question a long time trying to figure out uh, what, what it was getting at, but I, I'm assuming that we're talking about outside groups who are unhappy with some program that we're offering, trying to pressure the district to stop it. I think, first of all, we have to look at how effective is this program being. And for me, I would always go to the teachers first, the ones who are on the ground implementing it, and ask them, is this successful? Is this working for you? Is this uh, helping these students, helping these families? And if the teachers say, absolutely it is, then we as a district say, then we're absolutely going to continue to offer it. This is what our students need, and our top priority is uh, their education and well-being. And so that's what we're going to continue to do. If there are some valid concerns about something, teachers say this isn't working, then obviously we need to take a look at it and decide maybe, you know, maybe it's time to let this program go. But our first concern is always the education and the well-being of our students. How would you go about making decisions about a service or program if outside pressure is brought to bear on the board? Uh, the board's always going to get pressure from decisions they make. It's an elected office, it's a public office, and there's always going to be somebody that isn't happy with some of the decisions. Uh, the board establishes the policies and procedures. Uh, they uh, study them, they try to figure out what is the best for the students, best for the community, uh, and they have to weigh the pressure from outside as to, uh, against how good a program is, or how appropriate it is, or what the long-term benefits are from that program, as opposed to the immediate pressure and uh, that they may be getting. This might be an oversimplification, but of all the decisions, not just the ones that come with outside pressure, I like to think that I asked the question, is this the best thing for all our children? And I can't answer that in the affirmative. We really need to think about that. But that's how I look at decisions for the night for children. Thank you. This next question will be given to Mr. White. Oh, I'm marking them down. <laughs> 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 what should the decision-making process be when making tough choices when working with finite resources? How does one choose which programs to add, continue, or cut? What's best for the kids? Period. Well, when you have limited resources, I think you have to look first at perhaps reallocation. But sometimes we offer courses that very few students attend. And I think one of the other alternatives is to see if there's another course at Duco or someplace like that. that they can it's pretty expensive to offer you know, advanced calculus to six students in high school. Yeah, those are always tough decisions, and I think you do have to look at enrollment numbers and see how many students are interested in particular programs or classes that we offer. And unfortunately, if we have to make cuts, some of those uh, classes might have to be on the, on the chopping block. But, um, <coughs> but you pull in every available resource you have, obviously, to try to continue offering the high quality education, the extracurricular activities, all of the um, special things that students enjoy so much. It's a part of their social development as well as their academic development. 
and um, and you don't make cuts unless there is literally nothing else you can do to find the funding for those things. Thank you. The next question begins with Mr. Denny. And again, if you have those questions, Jim is picking those up. He has a stack ready to go. If you have um, questions on your mind, so I'll one down. You have some time still. The next question, what strengths do you bring to the school board? Well, I think 20 years of experience counts for something. But I am, by nature, an analytical person. Uh, a degree, my three degrees in engineering. Um, and I look at things logically and analytically. And I think that's a positive trait. I bring the perspective of both a classroom teacher who is aware of the stresses and tensions of trying to meet the needs of a whole classroom full of children, and a parent who obviously wanted the very best possible education for my own two children. And sometimes those things aren't always uh, able to both be met equally. So I have, I have an understanding of how that dynamic works, both sides of the parent-teacher conference table I've been on, and I know what's going through the minds of both of those people. Um, but in addition to that, I also, uh, as a pastor of a church, I work with my own church council, and we are different people with different opinions and ideas about what we think is going to be best for our community. And so I often have to work in groups where we may not see eye to eye on things, but we have the same common goal. And so I work to build consensus, I work to uh, help people understand where I think we need to go, and they push back, and we, we get there together. And so I think I have those skills to work with groups of people and to help us keep focused on our goal, our common goal, even if we have disagreements along the way. I am able to bring almost 40 years of experience working with school districts, school boards, teachers, parents, uh, and students. I feel that I uh, have had the uh, training to build consensus, to work as a team player. Uh, projects as uh, big as high schools aren't built by one person. I've been a, a team player and helped them get built. I believe I can bring logic and rationale through my engineering degree and an understanding of the arts through my architecture degree and uh, the opportunity to uh, help uh, a population of students that will live into the 22nd century uh, is a, a, a great desire. And so I bring desire, understanding, knowledge, and an ability to build consensus. Thank you. The next question will be given to Scott. <clears throat> what kind of relationship should the board have with the superintendent? Well, since the board is responsible for hiring and firing and evaluating the superintendent, in, in that one sense, it's a, uh, it's a boss-employee relationship, and so there needs to be that kind of structure put in place, that understanding needs to be there from the very beginning. But ultimately, what the board wants more than anything is for that person to succeed in that job, because if the superintendent is successful, then they're building a strong district. So. The board wants to be a cheerleader for that person, wants to uh, help facilitate as much as possible, um, whatever they can do to help that person be successful. But at the end of the day, they are responsible for evaluating the job performance of that person, and uh, it's, it may come down to the point where they have to actually fire someone. So um, they have to hold that tension between supervising and also encouraging at the same time. The relationship with the board uh, and the superintendent, the board hires the superintendent, he works for the board, the board works for the community. And so really, we are the intermediary, we would be, uh, the board would be the intermediary between the community and the, and the board. Uh, I think uh, even though he is an employee of the board, the board and the superintendent should work as a team and uh, be collaborative and interactive and discuss the issues, he is going to run the district for the board. He or she, excuse me, will run the district for the board. Uh, and uh, it is a, it's a, a business uh, to uh, 
we're advisors, he advises us. Uh, and then the board uh, should uh, share with the community what their goals and their desires for the superintendent are. I think there's um, an important relationship that exists between board members and between the board and the superintendent. I think the tenure of a superintendent is directly related to his relationship with the board and in turn the board members' relationships with each other. Uh, we've seen evidence in the surrounding communities over the years of board boards that are not particularly communicative or collaborative among themselves. And that's resulted in a shorter tenure for some superintendents. I think collaboration, communication, openness, honesty, trust, probably especially trust between the superintendent and the board members. The next question begins with Mr. White. Please describe what you believe to be the largest challenge facing the district in the next five years. Our demographic shifts. We have a, a district that has uh, is changing, as all districts do. But our demographic changes are dramatic. Uh, we have some uh, pockets that have socioeconomic difficulties, and those pockets seem to be growing. Uh, and we need to uh, help address education uh, needs in those pockets, which are quite different than some of the other district district. Uh, areas. Uh, as a West representative, we have uh, great diversity uh, within our community and we should address that, uh, the educational requirements of that diversity. So, and that is going to be a challenge because it requires us to uh, provide a, a variety of, uh, of uh, edu uh, educational programs and curricula for the different uh, uh, student populations. Our breadth of diversity is staggering. We have uh, schools in parts of our district that uh, seem to be the same as they were 10 or 15 years ago. And then we have schools in other parts of our district where parents perhaps are absent, perhaps they're single parents, great amount of poverty. Um, the challenges that face the district go beyond the education of all students. Our challenges are providing safety and security to some students who come through our doors who maybe haven't seen a smiling face in the last 12 hours. Maybe haven't eaten, maybe haven't changed clothes. We have a responsibility to educate every student that comes through our door. And that education it doesn't require just teachers, it requires an awful lot of resources beyond that. That would be our challenge. At the risk of stating the obvious, I think the biggest challenge is going to be funding the schools because we don't know what's going to happen um, at the state level. We don't know what's going to happen at the federal level and how that's going to impact and affect what we can do here on the local level. But I agree with uh, what both of these other gentlemen said, that the, the demographic changes that we're seeing in this district are phenomenal. And the diversity is, is incredible. It's, I think, one of our greatest strengths, but we haven't quite figured out how to use it as a strength yet. Um, we also have all sorts of new kinds of needs that we haven't had to deal with before. We have many, many more families who uh, have English language learners in the home. Um, reading the papers or getting concerned about the opioid epidemic and how it's swelling the ranks of foster care. So though that might be something else that we're going to have to deal with coming down the road as well. So all of these changing shifts in our culture are obviously going to impact our schools. And so we have to see what's coming ahead and try as best we can to prepare for it and to adequately meet all of those new needs that we haven't maybe had to address in the past. Last call for questions. Jim has a stack there if you have not written a question down. Or if you have a question still, you can write it down, give it to him. Um, I'll ask him to break those up probably after the next question so I can start to sort through those and look through those. We have four questions left in the magical basket. <laughs> the, next one, uh, the next question will go to Mr. Denning.
What do you believe are the most pressing issues to parents in your attendance area? Shawnee Mission West. You know, I think that every year I get some call, some question from parents saying, can't we go to school five days in a row for more than just a week or two of time in the spring? I don't mean to be facetious, but I think being able to communicate clearly what our school schedule is so that parents can then figure out daycare and depend on that, find out ways to, to allow YMCA and, and Johnson County to provide prior and after care at uh, less expense because when you have three children and they're all in elementary but you're working and they have to go before care and after care, that becomes a burden on them. I think the parents in the West area are facing what many parents in, in our community are facing, that they're working longer hours. Uh, some of them have had to take an additional job just to make ends meet. And so they cannot be as involved in their kids' education as they want to be, as they had hoped they could be. And so there is uh, this sometimes a lack of communication between what's happening in the schools and what's happening in the homes. And it's not because the parents don't want to be engaged and don't want to be involved. They simply aren't able to. There isn't enough time. There aren't enough resources. And so I think anything the schools can do to help those parents who do want to be more engaged, do want to be more involved, Communication is huge, it's key. We have to find ways to let these parents know what's happening, to maybe schedule things that might fit better with their work schedules, um, be more flexible. I know we're doing that a lot in terms of